All right, you know around this time of year, I love to keep the horror movie vibe going, and today we are gonna keep that tradition alive. Let's go. All right, everybody, we're going all the way back to 1981. I think we've been doing a lot of 1981 movies lately. Ah, it doesn't make a difference. Whatever. We are gonna take a look back at an American werewolf in London. This thing is classic. That's just the way it is. Anyway, let's keep going. Before we dig into this gem any further, before we look back at this motion picture anymore, once and again, and as always, to the trailer. Did you hear that? What was it? A coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. What happened to them? Well, the police report said they were attacked by an escaped lunatic. Must have been a very powerful man. Jack and I were not attacked by a man. It's an animal. A wolf. Did he say a wolf? Yes, I believe he did. Did you get a good look at the man who attacked you? Doctor, my memory is fine. It's my sanity I'm beginning to worry about. I've never had bad dreams before. Well, sure, as a kid, but never so real, never so weird. I'm going to look into your eyes. <laughs> My friend Jack was just here. <gasps> your dead friend, Jack. Hi, David! He told me that I will become a monster in two days. The supernatural, the power of darkness, it's all true. Please believe me. Believe what? That tomorrow night, beneath the full moon, I'll sprout hair and fangs and eat people? You'd be surprised what horrors a man is capable of. Are you all right now? I don't know. I'll let you know the next full moon. I'm a werewolf. You're going to change. You'll kill people. You'll become... I know. A monster. David, don't lose control! Your control? What control? David, I can help you. No, I'm not safe to be with. You gotta stay away from me. Run! And everybody dies in it. Alright, this motion picture was directed by John Landis. Big name, been around a long time. You have all seen his movies. Let's go. We're talking about he did The Blues Brothers. He did Animal House and Spies Like Us and The Three Amigos and Kentucky Fried Movie, movie I love, and Innocent Blood and now Beverly Hills Cop 3 and now Coming to America. He, he also did the Michael Jackson music video for Thriller. And Unfortunately, he was involved in Twilight Zone, the movie, where he caught a lot of flack, and deservedly so for. I mean, he put some actors in some situations that were dangerous, and there was fatalities. Vic Morrow, a couple kids, tragedy, never should have happened. Kind of marred his career. It is what it is, but let's keep going today. Playing David Kessler, David Naughton. One of those things, you always get that first name match. Whatever, it doesn't make a difference. We're talking about he was in little things like Hot Dog the Movie, and The Boy in Blue, and Private Affairs, and Separate Vacations, lots of TV too, Silk Stockings, Jag, Touched by an Angel, Grey's Anatomy, and Making It. Does anybody remember the show Making It way back in the day? Anyway, anyway, he actually, he actually sang the song for that thing. I don't know if you guys remember that, but there was a song, Making It. I think it was even on Solid Gold, is what it is. My nurse, Alex Price. Oh, God, she was so cute. Jenny Ogder. <laughs> Let's do this. We're talking about she was in little motion pictures like The Eagle Has Landed and The Survivor and uh, Amy and Dark Tower and Child's Play 2 and The Avengers and tons of TV. Monday, Monday, uh, The Beat Goes On, The Railway Children, The Newcomers, and of course, of course, of course, of course, of course. Did that sound a little bit like The Wizard of Oz? Whatever, it doesn't make a difference. She was in the one. The only Logan's Run. Oh yeah, you remember. And playing his buddy Jack, Dave's buddy Jack, the one and only Griffin Dunn, who really was kind of riding a kind of a high streak around this point in time. But we'll get there. We're talking about he was in motion pictures like 
After Hours, and Dallas Buyers Club, and Cold Feet, and Johnny Dangerously, does anybody even remember that? And Who's That Girl, and The Big Blue, My Girl, uh, Straight Talk, Quiz Show, and he was on TV, uh, House of Lies, uh, uh, Manhattan. So, been around, you've seen his face, you'll probably recognize him. Hey, Dr. Hirsch, John Woodfine. Let's take a look. We're talking about he was doing things like... Coronation Street, Edge of Darkness, Prisoner of Zenda, Doctor Who, The Bell, The Dustbin Men, New Scotland Yard, The Further Adventures of the Musketeers, and The Avengers. And by the way, everything I just mentioned is a TV show. He was really big on TV. It is what it was. Let's keep moving. Playing Inspector Villers, Don McKillop. Again, a TV guy. You know what I mean? TV titles. Anyway. Let's name a few of them. We were talking about little things like Coronation Street and Road to 1984 and Rosie and Z Cars and the Canal Children and Sutherland's Law and Doctor Who, like everybody else, and the Likely Lads. So, he was around, was in some things, popped up here. Let's keep this moving. And there's a few other names that we should just throw out and go through really, really quickly. We're talking about people like Lila Kay, and she was the barmaid, you know, she was in stuff like Nuns on the Run and See No Evil and TV, you know, Cafe American, you know, Emergency Award, whatever. And Brian Glover, he was a chess player in the end. We're talking Alien 3, come on, everybody's got to remember him from that. And To Kill a Priest and Jabberwocky, which nobody remembers and I love. And Rick Mayall, come on, he was on The Young Ones, which was huge when I was in my early teens and The Grim Tales. And David Schofield, you know, Gladiator, Pirates of the Caribbean. Valkyrie. So there's other names, there's other faces. You'll see them in this. They were young at the time, and you might just remember some of them. Either way, let's keep moving. Okay, everybody, I'm going to try to keep this to 90 seconds or less. I can shoot short, keep it fast, keep it moving, keep it entertaining. It's so we can get to, we much rather be the summation. Does that red light below make everything look spooky? Oh, why not? Something fun. Let's get moving. You got Jack. You got David, and they are running through the northern lands of England on a little bit of a vacation. Well, you know, I think Jack would much rather have been someplace else, but David really wanted to do this, and it is what it is. So they're going through the moors. They're walking around when they come across this little inn called the Slaughtered Lamb. And when they go in there, well, the locals just tend not to be that very friendly. But they warm up pretty quick, and they start joking with the kids and getting along with them. But... Jack does the stupidest thing in the world. He asks about why the five-star pentagram is on the wall. And when he does that, the locals kick him out. They don't want nothing to do with him anymore. They're like, son, you went too far. Get the hell out. But stay on the road. Stay off the moors. <laughs> anyway, before you know it, they're on their way and they're walking down. And what do they do? They go off the road and they wander onto the moors. And then they could hear the howling of, well, something, something big and something angry. It haunts them down. It chases them. You know, meanwhile, back at the end, the people are like, should we go out there and help these kids? Kind of letting you know there's some shit going on. You don't know if they do, you don't know if they don't, at least for the moment. Anyway, back to the moors, and you see the two of them, they're running from whatever it is, or at least the sound of it, when all of a sudden, a big giant dog from hell hits Jack, knocks him on his ass, and tears him apart. Seconds later, it goes to attack David, and all of a sudden, gunfire rings out, and it's the locals, and they save David. Kind of. And when David looks over, he sees a human being next to him. Not a big furry dog. And we all know something's afoot. Picks up a little while later, a few weeks actually, and David's in the hospital. He comes out of this coma. He's got a few scars. The doctor's like, you went through a traumatic event. Your friend is dead. Life sucks. Either way, it is what it is. David starts having these horrible nightmares. Actually, he starts getting visited by his dead friend, Jack, who tells him, you are going to turn into a werewolf. Some messed up shit's taking place, just to let you know. Well, after some rest and recuperation... Before you know it, they let David out. And where's David going to go as a stranger in a strange land? Yes! He goes to live, even though he's psychologically damaged, with the nurse that's taking care of him. I guess that seems okay. The doctor starts asking questions because he can't figure out why this guy has no medical history, why there was no history of when they bandaged him up and sent him to this hospital. So he goes out and he goes back to the slaughtered lab where even he realizes something isn't right. Well, before you know it, time moves on. Things kick down the road. David starts turning into a big furry werewolf and killing people. Jack keeps coming back from the dead to tell him he has to commit suicide. And before you know it, Alex is trying to save this newfound love of her life that she's only known for a little while. The doctor's trying to intervene, thinking he's crazy, but, you know, it's not his fault. And he's not really a werewolf, but he's just going through something. And the kid is trying to get himself arrested so he no longer can hurt anybody else. <sighs> That doesn't really work. Before you know, all hell breaks loose in the middle of London. And, well, it is what it is. I'm not going to tell you anymore. That would ruin the movie. I think it blew past 90 seconds. Doesn't make a difference. It's around Halloween time, and we're having fun. 
Let's get going to the summation. Okay, everybody, does an American Werewolf in London work? Goddamn right American Werewolf in London works. I enjoyed it. I had fun. That's all you need to know. So let's get going through the reasons why. First, the big three. The directing. The movie looks good. John Landis knows how to frame a shot. He knows how to make a movie work. It's simply put. It's pretty to look at. It's well shot, well lit. The cinematography in it is really good. So, from a visual perspective, you can't knock it. The writing. The writing is solid. It's funny. It's witty. Kind of engaging. It is what it is. So the writing really nails it, too. It's one of those motion pictures where you're sitting there like, I can listen to the dialogue and enjoy this, along with all the other crazy shit going on. And the acting. The acting is dead solid. All the people that feel like they're in the inn, you know, the locals, they feel like locals. They feel like people you would run into in that part of town. Everybody kind of feels right for the role that they're in. Yeah, David Naughton can be a little stiff every now and so often, but whatever. It doesn't make a difference. Everybody delivers. Everybody does a good job. <sighs> Jenny Agutter is cute as hell as Nurse Alex. And, you know, Griffin Dunn is funny as shit as Jack. So it all works and everybody carries their weight successfully. Now let's get back on track to why this motion picture works. Simply put, it delivers. It's funny. Yes, it is kind of a comedy. It's a dark comedy, but it's a comedy nonetheless. There's some scary shit going on it, so as a horror movie, it works too. It nails it on two little fronts. As an action movie, well, you know, there's moments where shit happens, there's moments there's not. There's dream sequences where there's a lot of crazy shit taking place. You're like, what the hell is going on? So, on a lot of different levels, it works for horror, it works for comedy, it works for kind of a love story because you got the situation between Alex, you got the situation between David, where even though it's kind of quick, it feels kind of fast. You can see and relate to the little love story in it, and it works on that level, too. So, really, no matter how you're kind of cutting it or slice it together, it works on a lot of different levels, and that's, that's hard to achieve for any motion picture. One of the other things that works in this motion picture, too, and it's just a stylistic thing I've kind of picked up on over the years, or maybe it's just the way I interpret it. Who knows? John Landis's motion pictures always have a certain feel to me. Like, they're real, but they're not real. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you go and watch something like, you know, The Seven Ups, or you go watch something like, you know, The French Connection, you feel like you're living in the grit of the reality. You're living in the world that you're actually in. When you watch Dog Day Afternoon, you're like, shit, I'm living in New York. This is it. This is it. This is what it's really like. All of his movies always feel like you're not really there, but you're kind of there. Do you know what I'm saying? It's one of those things where it's like you're not watching what's really happening. You're having a friend tell you what happened, and you're getting an interpretation of what something took place, or how something took place, I should say. So his movies always have that quality. They never feel real, even though they're supposed to be taking place in the real world. They're always just a little bit of a dream, or a fantasy, or a memory being explained to you. And you're kind of just visualizing it in your head. And that, that's taking place here, too. And let me just brush over a couple things I kind of just mentioned a second ago, but really quickly. Yes, this is a comedy, but it doesn't have an overbearing amount of comedy in it. There's just funny parts. There's just a dark humor that can lighten the mood and kind of elevate it above a straight horror movie. But it doesn't wreck it. It's not one of those things where you're watching it going, why are they putting this silly, stupid shit in this motion picture and ruining it for me? It's like you would feel it like during Gremlins. You know what I mean? Something like that. It's one of those motion pictures where there's just some humor in it, but it's still the motion picture that it's set out to be, and the humor doesn't wreck it or pull you out of it or shit can it. So, yes, I said comedy earlier, but don't let that throw you. And like I said earlier, too, the chemistry works fairly well between Jenny Agutter and David Norton. I, I, I wouldn't say it's the banging out of the park couple of all times, but I think most of it's probably just her because it's Jenny Agutter. Anyway, but they work well together on the screen. You kind of fall into their whole world, their whole Jack and Rose doomed before they got going type of relationship. So, again... It's one of those things that's a plus for the motion picture that maybe doesn't always get expressed in a lot of other horror movies. I mean, something like The Howling might not have had that in it. But here it is, and you kind of roll with it. It does have that classic 
tragedy tale of a werewolf motion picture. Yes, it is a complete tragedy. He doesn't want this. He doesn't need this. He doesn't ask for this. She didn't mean to fall in love with a guy who turns into a big giant wolf dog. It is what it is. So it does have that classic tragedy. Now, are there any negatives to the motion picture? Eh, I don't really think so. Not really. It is a departure from what some would like to think of as the classical werewolf movie. You know what I mean? He's not on two legs, running around, that kind of stuff. He turns into a dog. This is more, very more like, you know, something like The Beast Must Die than it will ever be something like The Howling or the classic old-time werewolf movies where this is just a dude that literally turns into a dog and a big fucking one at that and run around doing crazy shit. So, yes, it's not, it's not your traditional kind of werewolf movie, but it does have enough of the traditional stuff in it like the tragedy and the changing and everything where you kind of fall suit and roll in line with it. And while we're talking about changing into the big giant dog this motion picture cannot be overlooked when it came to the special effects especially within their time frame just the way it goes there was two big werewolf movies that year of course i already mentioned the howling and of course here we go with the american werewolf in london those were your two big hitters that year and you had rick baker who was doing this, I mean, he was like, this is one of his great grandiose achievements in the history of his career, was this transformation scene. It was incredible, it was brilliant, and it was well done. He was actually working over there for a bit on The Howling, and then Rob Bottin took over and did the whole transformation thing, who went on to do the most insane shit I ever seen in my life in The Thing. So, between Bottin and Baker in 81, it was the year of the werewolves, and this is one of those times where you see amazing practical effects that look stunning, that I still have not seen anything digital ever equal, and God forbid even talk about rivaling, in all of my years. There's a reality to this. There's a physicality to this. There's a practicality to this. You know it's real. You know you can reach out and touch it. It looks amazing. It looks incredible. Anyway, everybody, get out there and watch yourself an American Werewolf in London. Don't waste your time with an American Werewolf in Paris, which was made decades later and sucks on every level completely imaginable. Go see an American Werewolf in London. Now, two other things I should point out. One, it has a really cool soundtrack. There's some great Credence Clearwater Revival music in it. The soundtrack is kicking. Just enjoy that. Number two, the pacing is really well. This movie, for such a, a, a movie that feels like it's big in scope and feels like there's a lot going on, is only 98 minutes long, which is pretty short, really, for a, a, a big Hollywood, well, I guess London, but whatever, you know what I'm saying, production level event. 98 minutes is kind of short, but it makes the movie feel nice, concise, direct, simple, Yet, it doesn't feel rushed. So I think the timeline they gave this thing of 98 minutes and the way it was directed and the way it was paced, which you know I bitch about all the time, was spot on and on par with just anything you could ever ask for. Okay, everybody. Be good. Take care. Stay out of trouble. Be kind to a stranger. Be there for a friend. But most of all, never, and I mean ever, take any bullshit from anybody. See you soon, maybe without the spooky lighting next time. Hmm.